Well, good morning, church family. Everybody doing good today? Glad you're with us, man. I got to share this with uh, Second Service last week, but didn't with you. Uh, my assistant, Jamie, always puts some water in my office here at the uh, church, and uh, she does a great job helping me out. And, and I realized that she did something special. Um, this last time she picked up water, she got, I didn't even know this was a thing, Chuck Norris water. <laughs> yeah, you zoom in on that. That's Chuck. Neely Campus, check it out. It's Chuck Norris Premium Artesian Water. It's called Sea Force. And so I felt pretty good about this sermon, but now that I have Chuck Norris water, I feel like I'm going to be able to knock this thing out of the park, all right? So thank you, Jamie, for giving me some Chuck Norris water. That's going to really help. Uh, I hope you have some Chuck Norris water. If not, tough. Go buy it. Um, Turn in your Bibles to Exodus uh, chapter 3. We're going to be in Exodus 3, and then we're going to turn over to Exodus chapter 19 here in a minute. So we're going to be in Exodus 3 first. Then we're going to be in Exodus 19. Um, uh, And I got to tell you just right up front, kind of, I got two goals. All right. So just so you know, there's two goals for today. Number one, uh, I want to get us to a place where we're committed to worship together. Now, for those of you in the room, that's really good news because you're here. You're already succeeding at one of the two things I'm asking you to do. You're here worshiping God together. That's what we're doing. I want to, I want to just at the end of it, I'm going to, I'm going to lift up the importance of this, uh, whether you're at Neely Campus 191 or online. And those of you watching online, we're so grateful for our online expression. But I'm also going to kind of challenge you a little bit if you haven't been in person in a while. And that's an option for you. We'd love to see you in person because we think God has something special for you when you're together in worship. We're going to talk about that today. And then secondly, I'm going to ask you to commit to serve. If Mid-Cities is your spiritual family, uh, to commit to serve in some capacity and join a dream team. And so you can do that. There's a QR code in front of you. Uh, You can take your camera and just zoom it in. Normally with the camera, you got to zoom a little bit. Uh, Whether you're in the pews here at Neely uh, or here at 191 or in the chairs at Neely, you can zoom in on that QR code. And right at the very top, it it just says, uh, join a dream team and sign up. There's lots of different places to serve. And I'm going to ask you uh, to serve somewhere. I'm going to ask you to jump in in some capacity. And uh, so I'm going to do that at the end of today, but you can participate at any time during the sermon. So just a a full disclosure kind of of where we're going to go. Now, before we dive into Exodus 3, I want you to take a moment to imagine slavery. I want you to imagine day in, day out rest, uh, day out work with no rest. Well, you don't run your own schedule. You don't run your own calendar. Decisions are made for you. You're void of hope, despair, depression. Purpose and meaning are relative. Uh, your slave masters treat you as property, as interchangeable assets that are only worth what you will produce for them. No intrinsic value, always being watched at all times. This is the Israelites' experience for 400 years under slavery in Egypt. Matter of fact, they were enslaved by the Egyptians, building their buildings, serving their families, attending their whims and desires, always being watched every day working for 400 years. The people of Israel cried out to God and God heard their cry. And he raised up a deliverer named Moses. Moses was an Israelite who was raised in Pharaoh's household and upon discovering his uh, uh, adoption, sought to rediscover his Jewish identity and uh, was eventually exiled from Egypt, watching sheep in the wilderness. And it was near these sheep, these cattle, these livestock in the wilderness that he was watching when he came across a burning bush. And God spoke to Moses through the burning bush and gave him some clear instructions of what Moses was to do in response to the Israelites' cry. We find that in Exodus 3, verse 9 through 12. It says this, And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression for which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, but I will be with you and you shall be, this, this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. 
you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses repeated this refrain over and over out throughout the entire book of Exodus with his encounter with the leader of the Egyptians, Pharaoh. He would tell them over and over again in uh, Exodus 3, 12, uh, 4, 23, 7, 16, 8, 11, 29, and on and on and on. Over and over again, he would say the same thing. In essence, what he would say is, let my people go so that they can come and serve or worship me. He would say it over and over again. Let my people go so that they can come and serve or worship me. Let my people go so they can come and serve and worship over and over again. Let them go. Let them go to the mountain. They're going to go and meet God on the mountain and there they're going to encounter God and and, and so let my people go. And when we go back to this word that God used to Moses in verse 12 of Exodus 3, it says this. It says, and he said, I will be with you and this will be a sign for you that I've sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, so you've come out of slavery, out of bondage, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now this is the ESV, uses the word serve God. But if you have the NIV or some other translations, it may say worship God. And the reason there's a difference there with some translations is because in the original language in Hebrew, you could go either way. You could use the word serve. I'm going to do things. I'm going to, I'm going to serve. I'm going to, what we would think of as serving, doing something for someone else, right? Work for someone else. But it was interchangeable. The same sense as worship. Now, when we think of worship, Oftentimes we kind of in a Christian context limit that to singing songs to God. And of course, that's a part of it. Lifting our voice to declare God for who he is, that he's our king, that he's our Lord, he's deity, he's worthy of worship, he's worthy of our affections, he's worthy of our time, he's worthy of us to, to sing about, to declare, to proclaim. Like that's a part of worship, so that's why we do. We just did, spent... 10 minutes, a moment ago, in, in a, a, a way of worship. But here, in this idea of serving or worshiping God, it expands worship, that worship is your, aren't just songs to God or the song part of a service, but worship extends to serving God. And when we serve God, we, in essence, are worshiping God. Do you get the idea? That, he, that this is what he goes. He says, so, so in essence, he says, I want to, you to let my people go, God says to Pharaoh, so that they can come and serve me, so that they can come and worship me. So God was not just setting them free from bondage to slavery and from endless work and hopelessness and inevitable futility from death. He was in fact calling them to, a, to something. He was not just calling them away from something. He was calling them to something. And it's important. He was calling them away from slavery, away from bondage, but he was calling them to worship. He was calling them to service, where they would come and meet with him on the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, where they would serve him together, where the Israelites would worship together, where they would learn and love and serve one another together. And eventually, as many of you know from this story, Pharaoh relented. He sent the Israelites away. They were free. Yet the enemy decided to chase them and they were going to come after them. They didn't want them to be free. They had regrets. So here Pharaoh and his army chased them all the way to the Red Sea. And there at the Red Sea, God miraculously parted the waters where they went through the water from death to life, from slavery to freedom. Their captives and enslavers drowned in the watery grave. Soon they found themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai where God told Moses to bring them and meet him there. They would no longer serve the Egyptians, no longer be enslaved to their ways or their desires, but they would serve and worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in Exodus 19, 1 through 6, we find this encounter. Here they are after gone through the Red Sea. They're there at the mountain of God in Mount Sinai. And here's what the Lord tells Moses to tell them. Exodus 19, verse 1. On the third new moon, after people of Israel had gone out from the land of Egypt on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And they set out from Rephidim, and they came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness 
There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Here, after they had left 400 years of slavery, they found themselves at the foot of the mountain, and there they had new instructions. They met a new God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of their forefathers. They were, had a new responsibility. They were to be priests, priests to the nations. What are priests? Priests are, are mediators between God and man. That's what priests are. And, and that's what their role was, is to be holy priests. They were to be set apart, different from all the other nations, different from all the other people. And they were to, to be mediators between them, to obey him and serve him. So here they are. They aren't just called out of slavery, out of bondage. They're called to a new purpose. They're called to new life. They're called to a new land, a new master, a new God. In the same way, Scripture tells us as human beings that we too were slaves. Slaves to sin. Slaves to ourself, slaves to our own passions and desires, worshiping and serving ourselves and our own interests, lifting up the idols of money and desires and passions and fears of ourselves. And God sent a deliverer, Jesus, who leads us out of bondage and away from hopelessness. As our captors pursue us and chase us, our sins are drowned in a watery grave of repentance as we cross from death to life by faith. Jesus says it's the only way to get into the presence of God, the only way to meet the Father and be at his mountain. There is only one way to the promised land, to the, to the, to the presence of God, to experience freedom. It's in God's presence we're called to, to worship him and to serve him. No longer a slave to sin, we are restored with a, a common purpose. We have a new God, a new purpose, a new land to go to, a, a, a new way about us. We are too called to be holy or set apart. We too are called to be priests, uh, 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 mediators between God and the rest of the world, carrying God's message, uh, just like the Israelites were. We see this new life, new purpose, new master, new God in this Christian life he's called us to. We see this happen in the Exodus story, and we see this happen in our own Exodus story, in our own salvation experience. Set free from the bondage of sin and self, not just free from something, but free to something. So with that in mind, it means that God has called me out of sin or slavery He's called me to, number one, be with him together with others. And he, two, he's called me to worship and serve him together with others. Now let me flesh that out a little bit. He's called me out of sin. Sin is an incredibly harsh slave master. It will rule you and ruin you and take you beyond anywhere you want to go. But the only way out of sin is through, Jesus says, through faith in him and repentance. We repent of our sin, meaning we turn from it, and we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And as we do that, he calls us out of sin, but he calls us out of sin to be with him. Sometimes we live this Christian life and we've experienced this, and maybe you're kind of the way you grew up enforced this was that the whole ball game in the Christian life was to keep away from the bad stuff. You know, if we can just keep away from all the bad stuff, then, then we'll be okay. Like, we're just trying to keep all the bad things at bay. Don't do this. Don't do that. If you step on this line, if you go to this thing, if you say this word, if you act this way, you're going to hell. Anybody else understand what I'm talking about? 
That, that's what it was about. It was about, it was about like, you can't, you can't, you, you, it's, it's God saved you from those things, so keep it away. But here we see a more compelling vision that it's not that you, he just sets you free from slavery, it's free from self, free from sin, but he calls you to be with him. He calls you to the mountain of God for you to come and eat with him and be with him and worship him and serve him. And he doesn't just do it you and him alone. He does it you with a whole bunch of other people. Other Christians, other, other friends that you have that are responding in the same way. Other married couples, other singles, other college students, other high school students. Like, like he's calling them out of sin and to himself, but you're not alone. He's doing it with your family. He's doing it with other friends. Does this make sense? And so you're coming to meet with God and you're not just meeting with him one-on-one, -on -one. you're meeting with him with a bunch of other folks. And there's something special about the fact that you're not just one-on-one -on -one with God, but you're there with others. And you're not just there just to stay there forever, but you're there to get a mission, to get a new purpose, because he's going to cause you to come serve him. So if you're going to serve him, your service to him is an act of worship. Does this make sense? So your service to him is an act of worship. So you're not just coming to sing songs together perpetually around God's mountain. You're coming to meet with God to get a download of what he's called you to do, to get your new purpose and the new land that he's called you to go to and that he promises when he sends you, he ain't sending you alone. He's going with you and you get to go with others. Does this make sense? And this is an accurate description of the Christian life. That, that, that what God's called you to isn't easy. Matter of fact, there was a promised land he had given the Israelites. You'd think, hey, you should just be able to walk in and take it. No, they had to contend for the promised land that God promised them. There were wars and fights and there was, there was they had to contend for it. It, was, it didn't just come automatically. No, 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 no. This Christian life I'm not saying is easy, but what I'm saying is it's incredible because God's presence is always with you and he's called people to be around you to go with you in this walk and in this journey. And I think this is important for us to get. This was true of the Israelites and it's true of you and I today. What does this mean? Let me, let me, let me flesh this out a little bit of what it means. I think it's four things I wanna, wanna just highlight. What does it really mean? Here's what it means. Number one, I am not alone. I'm not alone. I, I don't know about you, um, but, but truthfully, this is a, a crazy season and um, the last several years, more people f have felt lonely than ever before. Uh, there was a season in recent time where many people were at home alone by themselves. If you were single, maybe there was days, maybe weeks, you didn't even see anybody for a while because of the lockdowns. Uh, even if you're married uh, or, or have a family in your home, you were, you, you know, it was, it, the lockdown was incredibly hard on you. And some people have, uh, were, were uh, par partitioned off from workers. And so they didn't get to mix it up with their workers, their friends, and things were canceled across uh, the globe. And, and so there was a loneliness, right? There was a, an aloneness that happened during that time. And as a result, there's even repercussions to this day from that. And maybe even before the pandemic, you felt lonely. Maybe even before then, there was a, a loneliness in your soul. You could be surrounded by people, but you felt kind of alone. And here's what I want to tell you. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, who has repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus, Jesus promises that you might feel lonely, but you're never actually alone. The promise of Jesus is, is that he will be with you always to the very end of the age. That, that no matter where you turn, no matter what you've done, no matter what you haven't done, you're not alone, but Jesus is with you. Well, well, Daniel, what if I've walked in sin? What if I've really messed up? I get it. Jesus is with you. He loves you. 
What if, what if, what if I, I haven't done all the things I'm supposed to? I, I get it. Jesus loves you. He's with you. What if, Daniel, what if I'm going through a divorce? What if I'm going through a hard time and my business is falling apart or whatever it is? No, I get it. Here's what you need to know. Jesus promised he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. You may feel lonely, but you're never alone. He is always with you. He is always there. And actually, more than Jesus, he has put around us a group of people who, just like us, have been saved from our own sin, who, have, who were enslaved to our own sin for a long time, but now we are set free. And he promises us, not only are we not alone because he's going to be with us, but he sets us in spiritual family. That's what this whole series has been about. He puts people around us who care about us and love us, that can bear our burdens and we can bear their burdens and that we can walk together. And if we're willing to be vulnerable, if we're willing to be real with them and them with us, then we can have a deep relationship and friendship to walk out this, this journey that God's called us to. And so I got to just tell you, man, as I've walked with Jesus for the years that I've walked with him, I have never been alone. I can just testify. I felt lonely at times. There's times I felt alone, but I've never actually been alone. God's presence is with me because he didn't just call me out of sin. He called me to himself and he called you to himself too. His presence is with you, but not only is his presence with you, man, let me just tell you, it's so great. He's called you to be with others. And, and I, I've, I've, I've experienced that from early on my childhood walking with good friends in the church that were following Jesus alongside me. And we got to follow Jesus together through my college years of having roommates, man, that would encourage each other and pray together and confess sin to one another. To young married with Kayla and I, we had friends that, that we would play, play spades with and dominoes because that's like all the money we had to do. Anybody else ever there like, like hey, what, do we, what can we do that's cheap? <laughs> Let's uh, make some coffee and just hang out at the house. This is, we had friends that we would just hang out and talk with and en encourage in their faith and they would tell us about their own journey and we'd be inspired by that or encouraged or they would pray for us or we'd pray for them. And then you, you, you continue on. You have other friends that God brings in your life. And let me just tell you, the friendships that God provides, the family members that he brings in are rich and they, are, they remind you of God's constant presence. But it's not something that just happens. You have to engage yourself in it. And I wanna just call you and remind you today that you're not alone. Because Jesus sets you free from sin and slavery to sin and to himself and to others, he reminds you that you're not alone. Second thing that this means, this truth means, is that I am free from sin. I'm free from slavery. If Jesus has set me free, I am free indeed. That's what we believe here. That, and, and let me just tell you, it's important, the whole together with others idea, because sometimes you need others to remind you of your identity in Christ. Sometimes you need other people to remind you of who you are, because sometimes you forget who you are. Can I get an amen from somebody? Sometimes we forget who we are. We forget our own way. We forget our identity. And we need others to say, you know what? Yeah, that's who you were, but that's not who you are anymore. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had, people that get, struggle with certain things and you go, man, I'm, I'm struggling with this and I get it, but you know what? God's made you a new creation through his strength and power. Man, this doesn't have to have a hold on you anymore. See, the beautiful thing about being set free from sin, being forgiven, set free from sl the slavery of sin is that we don't have to be enslaved to it anymore. It doesn't mean we're not tempted anymore. It doesn't mean we don't occasionally sin. What it means is it doesn't have to control us like it used to control us. That it do, it's not our master anymore. We have a new master and it's the Holy Spirit of God leading our lives. Jesus leads us and guides us. Amen? And so... So this is, this is important because if we know that God's called us out of slavery to be with him and to worship and serve him, not only are we not alone, that we, we realize that we are free from sin and that we get to remind one another of this truth. God reminds us over and over again. This isn't who you are, it's who you were. Thirdly, that 
if, what does this mean? It means that I am to worship God with others. If God has set me free from sin, free from slavery, to be with him and to worship and serve him, then I am to worship God with others. There, there should be on some level a commitment to pursue God and honor God and lift up God along with others that he has in fact gathered around. There's something about being in God's presence with other people. There's something about being with God at his mountain with everybody else and you look around and you see your friend and you knew that they, they, they had it worse off than you did in slavery. They had a, a cruel taskmaster. Yours was bad, but theirs was really bad. And you, you see them and now they're free, standing in the presence of God, worshiping. There's something that happens when we go to worship God together. The, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, save one, are all designed to be reliant upon the fact that others are there. I can have a gift of teaching, but how is that teaching expressed if there's nobody to teach? Right? I can have a gift of leadership, but if nobody's around for me to exercise that gift of leadership, I'm just leading myself. You can have a word of knowledge. I was talking to a brother the other day from our Neely campus. He was telling me about a, a service at our Neely campus just the other day that they were in the service and he's one of our leaders there. And he, God, God gave him a sense, a kind of a prophetic word of knowledge about a family that he didn't know that was in the sanctuary. And uh, he grabbed them afterwards and said, hey, can I pray for you? Prayed for them with this thing that the sense that the Lord had given him. And you know what? God opened an incredible door for ministry. Well, that, that's only possible when there's more than just one person. You can't do that online by yourself. You can't do that in a truck with just you and God. You can't do that with you out in nature. You've got to be in God's presence at his mountain with the people of God. And when that happens, something special happens. There's something that gets stirred up. I, I can just tell you that, 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 that the significant moments oftentimes in my life for breakthrough have happened not just alone with God. There's been significant moments, but many of them are in worship together with his people. Where that we're here together and God's speaking or God, you sense God's presence in a unique way. And let me just tell you, that can happen in a home. It can happen here in a, in a church service, in a sanctuary. It can happen in lots of different places. But there's something about happening when we're committed to coming to lift up the name of Jesus together. Using our voice and our hands and our bodies to clap, to sing, to shout out that we are set free. We are made new. That we're not who we used to be, but we're a new creature. As we declare that together, there's an encouragement that occurs. There's an edification. Matter of fact, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are used to be, to be used together in the body of Christ, this happens when the body of Christ is gathered together. The word church, the very word church means ecclesia. In the original Greek, it's ecclesia, which means gathered. It's the gathered ones. They're gathered together. It's this unique, the church is so beautiful because it's true. It's the church for all of time, all, all of time put together in all places. It's in Rome and it's in uh, South America and it's in Europe and Africa and it's in Asia and it's in America and it's in West Texas and it's right here and it's here and now and it's, uh, and it's our parents' generation and it's the next generation all combined together in, in its broadest sense, but in its narrowest sense, it's a hand full of brothers and sisters coming together, gathered together. But rarely is the church referred to as you by yourself in a car, you by yourself in nature, you by yourself online. Does this make sense? So here's what I'm saying. We are called, because Jesus has done this, he's called us to worship together. He's called us to lift up his name together. He's called us to be committed to one another and committed to him in worship. And finally, he's called us. What does it mean? It means that I am to serve God with others. Not just to worship, but to serve. And I distinguish that. I know I'm using those interchangeably, worship and serve. But there's something about serving God together that does something in us that nothing else will do. The Israelites were tasked to go and be Priests, they were to be holy or set apart. Priests, 
mediating a, a relationship with God and the world. This is in the nations around them. They were to go and take the land that God had given them into the promised land. And to do all of that, it was a we, not a me. They had to go together. They had, they had to go together. And so when we get instructions from God, it's less about just, God, what do you want me to do? Is what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? How do you want us to act? What do you, what do you want us to do? And let me just tell you, for me, personally, the, the, the most significant moments in my life um, in my walk with God has been the things he's called me to do, not alone, but along with others. To, to serve mid-cities, to be a part of what God is doing in ministry, to to go accomplish something great for the kingdom of God uh, together. And so you begin to dream together and you begin to worship together and encourage one another together. And, 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 and you're the, it's the together part that makes the doing what God's called you to do part so special oftentimes. When we begin to serve God together. And so... Oftentimes, we don't think of it this way. When we think of worship and serving God, we distinguish them. You know, worship is singing a few songs and worship and serving is actually doing stuff. But I got to just challenge that and say, no, you know what? When we're doing things for God that he's called us to do in edifying, encouraging one another, it's worship. But when we worship the Lord and we lift up our voice to him, you're serving him and you're honoring him and serving the body as well. Both are true. And man, I'm just telling you, at Mid-Cities, I've always been encouraged and blown away by how people respond uh, to serving and honoring God with worship. One of them, uh, let me just share a few of them. This is the Coleman family, Jeff and Kendra, uh, Caden and Catherine. Caden's 15, Catherine's 12. They serve in our greeter team together. And uh, one of the things that they're, uh, they're, a captain that serves over their greeter teams acknowledges just their passion to serve and pass their passion down, Jeff and Kendra, to their kids as they serve together as a family, as a team, which is so incredible to see them every week welcoming people in. Some people who have been here maybe never have walked into church. They come in nervous, maybe just like you did the first time you came in and they don't know where to go and they don't know what to do and they kind of wish they hadn't come and they had an argument in the parking lot on the way here. Come on, no, none of us have ever done that. And they're a little nervous about it. And yet there's somebody to greet them there to welcome them with the love of Jesus and say, hey, we're glad you're here. It's not just one, it's a whole family saying, hey, we're gonna serve together and honor God together. I love the poorest family. The poorest family, this is Fabian, Olga, Isaiah, Sasha, and Gianna. They serve in our early childhood ministry together as a family. Olga wrote this about uh, them serving together. I thought it was pretty incredible. It says, my husband and I serve, first of all, because Jesus served. We are called to be Christ-like. Secondly, because we want to be obedient. We are called to be the hands and feet of the church. Our relationship as a couple has grown in a deeper way since we served together. We decided to incorporate our children in serving because we want to train them up in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it like Proverbs 22, six says. We want to instill in them a heart of servitude that they will carry on with them for the rest of their lives. Isn't that cool? These guys serve faithfully. Then here's the Bradshaw family. Uh, Garrett and Kristen serve at our Neely campus. Uh, they do an incredible job at our Neely campus serving the fours and five years old in early childhood. And they were impacted by Shane and Kimberly Christopher. They saw Shane and Kimberly Christopher faithfully serving in there, making a difference in their own kids' lives and said, you know what? We can do that as well and jumped in and have been so faithful. These are just a few examples I could go on and on. Can we give these families a huge hand just for how they engage and serve faithfully? You know, something happens when we serve God together. Um, we, we get further from Egypt and closer to the promised land. When, when, we, when we put legs to it, when we begin to honor God and worship God, when we, when we gather, we gather, yes, to worship him. We gather to serve him, but we also gather to serve one another. 
There's equipping and there's training and encouraging. This is why we gather, to worship, to serve him and one another. And, and there's something about serving one another that helps us grow in our relationship with him. There's something about worshiping together that makes us grow and know him better and makes his presence more real and more felt. And this can't be done alone. We need one another. Because family worships together. Family serves together. It's what, it's what we do. And so I want to just ask today, where are you serving in this family? If Mid-Cities is your spiritual family, and let me just tell you, if you're a guest, we don't expect guests to serve and jump in there, but we do. If Mid-Cities is who God's called you to be a part of, if this is your spiritual family, to go, you know what, I can, I can jump in and I can worship and serve in this way. Commit to worship, commit to serve. There's a, there's a QR code in the back of the pew in front of you. I want to encourage you, if you haven't done that and taken that step, I want you just to grab your phone and, and take that picture before you leave today. Um, and get that link. Uh, and there at the top of the link is, uh, it says join, to be, join, a, join a dream team. Just like this, jump on a dream team at 191 campus. If you're a Neely, it'll be a Neely campus. Just put your information right there uh, and we'll get a hold of you and we'll say, hey, man, we want you to hear some opportunities to serve and we'll follow up uh, so that you can join in with what God's doing here because God has something special for you. And I want to pray for, I want to pray for you, you that were making that decision today. I also want to pray for those that have faithfully served God here at Mid-Cities as a part of our spiritual family for years. So as I, as I take a moment to pray for that, I want you to prepare your hearts because we're going to enter back into a moment of worship. Uh, just for a few moments, we're going to worship God at Neely Campus here at 191 and, and really engage God together because there's, as we recall how Jesus has set us free from our own sin, from our own slavery and set us free to be with him and to be with one another and to serve him and to worship him, as we consider that, let it express itself in worship today uh, and let that come out. Amen? So would you stand with me? Lord, I just pray that you would help us today. I pray that you would help us and with an act of worship we come before you and we want to honor and serve you and you alone. Lord, I just pray right now for those that are committing today to serve and say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to do this. I, I want to get in the game. Lord, I just pray that they would just encounter you in such a deep way as they begin to fulfill a new, your new purpose and the mission and plan you have for their lives. God, I thank you that you've called us to worship you. That our, that our response of you saving us and transforming us is a transformed and changed life. That you're worthy of our, our voice. You're worthy of our humility. You're worthy of our service. Father, you are our creator where you're created. So we come to your mountain. And we say, whatever you have for us to do, we'll do. Wherever you want us to go, we'll go. And you're worthy of all of our praise. For you've heard our cries. You've delivered us from sin and self. Thank you that you didn't leave us there. But you responded. So Lord, with that heart, with that attitude, we respond and worship to you now.